Can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, it's a real uh, uh, honor to, to speak at this uh, conference uh, in front of this audience. And um, really happy about telling you uh, a recent work I've done in collaboration with the, uh, these fantastic collaborators, Joan Elias Miro, Ricardo Rattazzi, Mark Rimbo, and Francesco Riva. And it's about uh, universal properties that uh, scattering amplitude uh, enjoy in, 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 the, in, the, in the infrared. So as an, uh, they're gonna put constraints on effective theory in the deep infrared. And we all know, of course, that uh, with some coefficients um, are bounded to satisfy basically constraints coming from symmetries along their G flow as they, as they evolve from the UB. But there are more, many more constraints that apply to them and notoriously, you know, perhaps the, 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 the simplest and most known is the positivity of, of C2 here, the coefficient S squared term that Claudia uh, have been discussing uh, during his talk. What I want to tell you today is that that's just basically the tip of a big geometric iceberg. And uh, I want to basically discuss uh, how to chart this iceberg that just uh, uh, beneath the surface. So if you go just closer to the surface, you, see, you will discover other linear relations between dimension operator with uh, uh, different dimensions. So we connect to the cutoff of the effective theory itself. And if you go be beneath the surface and start going down, you discover nonlinear relations and relations also uh, involving parameters that involve the T minus some variables here, so a finite T correction and so on and so forth. There are infinitely many of them. And so the question I am gonna basically answer in this talk is, is the following. So what's the theory uh, that generates uh, this landscape of, uh, of inequalities for the uh, parameters in, in the amplitude? Basically, I'm not interested really any single one of these inequalities in itself, I mean, this bound, just see the structure uh, um, the structure behind uh, the, these inequalities. And uh, um, in the way in, in doing this, so I will basically uh, show you what complete set of positive bounds is. And often one well, access, access only a final number of them. So I will, bring, I will bring the question how you can put optimal bounds with a final number of them. Of course, they run. So bound, so the with superficial different scales are different. So uh, discuss what the interplay is with their G flow. And especially how you can use the, this inequality, these bounds with a coefficient to find what the cutoff of the effective theory is. And finally, I want to mention something briefly very towards the end about the role of higher divergences and uh, application to Galileans. After all, this as, as, a, as a conference on, on cosmology. So I want to mention the, the, the Galileans as well. I think this is very important. Uh, um, and, and, and one reason is that we, we all care about this question that how to separate the swamp plant from the landscape. So things that we observe at low energy seems to be uh, much more restrictive than what, that, what we could have written uh, following the power counting rules of effective field theories. So the question is how to define this boundary. And I think the inequalities that you can derive from uh, um, positivity of, of the amplitudes are one such a uh, um, way to, 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 draw, to draw this boundary. And this question is not only relevant when you talk about strings uh, or quantum gravity that of course generates in the infrared only a subset of all possible effectively you could write down that emerge from the G flow, uh, G evolution of a consistent theory, but uh, it's meaningful this question also in the context of quantum field. And how you can embed the generic effective field theory within a consistent quantum field theory. Uh, regardless of gravity, we impose further constraints. Okay, so this talk, uh, as I said, is about positivity bounds. Uh, now, Claudia already mentioned a lot of the details that go into this, so we'll be very briefly here. Essentially, we're talking about two to two scattering amplitudes, and because of uh, causality, unitarity, and locality, they are analytic function in the uh, Mandelstam 
a variable s, a fixed t. This allows you to uh, derive a UV IR connection of this form. So you draw a little contour in the infrared, or you can calculate things with effective theory. And you learn about Wilson coefficients there during these integrals, so that you can compute. And the form of the integral by analyticity, you, 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 you can relate this infrared quantity here to an integral over a discontinuity over, uh, over the imaginary code with the discontinuity of the amplitude across the branch cuts. And, and that is positive because of unitarity. So you learn immediately that things like S square, which is the first term that makes this integral convergence must be positive. This has been uh, known uh, I mean, since the eighties, but has been put in the modern, you know, really correct understanding in, in this beautiful paper here and, uh, and uh, being generalized only very recently to, to uh, any spin in, in these two papers, uh, in forward limit and beyond forward. Let me give you an example why this is interesting. We, Impose like imagine we have a, a theory in the infrared that is a theory of Goldstone's has a nice shift symmetry, pi into pi plus constant that selects which operators you are allowed to write down, which are not those which are not suppressed. You get the kinetic term, which is good. This is a theory of particles which are weakly coupled in the infrared, and then you get d pi to the fourth is the first interaction term. The coefficient itself is not determined; it can be zero, negative, or positive. But in fact, because of this argument, only C positive is allowed, is consistent with, with these assumptions. So C negative is in the swamp. Now, if you want to generalize this and find all set of possible bounds, the thing that we, we, we did was to realize the following, that this integral here, we used that the measure that this imaginary part is positive, it's integrated uh, uh, against the variable uh, one over S to the power of N which is clearly a form of moment of a distribution in the variable one over s. So that's the thing that uh, we, we are gonna use that. After all, these little things that we are computing in infrared are, are gonna be moments of certain distributions. The theory of moments is something that's very well uh, understood by mathematicians since uh, a century ago. Let me give you first an analogy why moments uh, bring much, or think about moments bring much more information. Consider this analogy with a star, or perhaps a neutron star, something that you know that exists in nature, has a positive energy density, and considering something uh, with a spherical symmetry. And the first moment associated with the, with the, with the star, it just is total mass, which is positive because the energy density is positive. The second moment in units of the mass and the radius is another number here, which is also positive, again, because of positivity of the measure. And so on and so forth. So you you know you know that these uh, things are positive, but you know more in fact because the little r here is smaller than capital R. So if you replace this with capital R, you know that m1 is actually less than one. And so for m2, this little r square is smaller than r square cap, capital R square. So this one is actually more smaller than this one. So you get what are called uh, like a monotonic series or a double sided bound. M2 is smaller than one which is also larger than M3, which is larger than M4, and so on and so forth. So in fact, in the space of M1 and 2, the first two moments, they are not only are positive, but they live in this square. And moreover, because they are monotonic, they actually you exclude this triangle. So first of all, you see just basic reasoning already are excluding much more than just positivity. You can be smarter than that, just rather than integrating monomials, now you start integrating more complicated functions against the measure, like R, capital R, minus little r squared, which is positive. So this is positive. And because of this minus sign here, you get a non-trivial bound that involves moments M1 and M2. And this excludes this other triangle here. You have to be actually in this uh, narrow region. Now you keep going. So let's integrate against this polynomial now, which is also positive. Now. The, the game seems to stop here in the sense that it involves M3, a new moment. Suppose you're going to measure only M1 and M2. So it seems you don't learn much. But in fact, you can take convex combinations, so the linear combination with positive coefficients, to eliminate M3. So you add M3, for example, to this inequality, it removes this guy. So this is positive, it cuts out this other triangle. And you keep doing that, you cut this further triangle. So if you do it 
an infinite many times, at the end of the day, all the space of moments that select by positivity is this one, so which is rather constrained. So in fact, it's bounded, first of all. It's not that you can go and one can be arbitrarily large with respect to what M2 is doing. The moments here are completely uh, uh, nailed to this, to this compact space. Um, the main lesson so far is the following. All bounds that come from positivity are basically one-to-one -one correspondent to labeling the most general positive function you can integrate the, the measure against. And it's always possible taking convex combination to remove the moments you don't care. And so project in a finite subspace. And if you have infinitely many linear relation, that's the same as uh, uh, getting nonlinear bounds. So this was an analogy, so like a preview. Let's make it actually a perfect analogy, so like an equivalent statement. So let's define what we call arcs. Uh, arcs are basically an integral of the amplitude along a contour here in the S plane above threshold. It's going to be important, uh, the two particle threshold here. And this is going to be a, a moment. I'll show you that uh, in a moment. And but let, first, again, let me stress that this is, again, calculable in the inference. Some quantity is going to depend on your width of coefficients. So it's, it's an infrared representation of a physical quantity. Now, you can deform the contour integral, and you can write it you know, in terms of a UV representation. Um, in the, like before, except now the integration goes from S hat to infinity, where S hat is the radius of this arc. It's going to measure. It's going to measure the energy you're probing uh, uh, with your with the, your arc. It's going to be the measure of the energy flow uh, as we would see toward in in this talk. But up to a change of variables, you can recast it up to an overall normalization factor here, precisely in the form of a moment. Okay. And we just saw. So now that the, the analogy is perfect, we just know that the theory space is past, is just the same as classifying all possible positive functions they live in this compact space. So what are they? What, what, what's the space of positive function? Well, any function that's continuous in a compact space can be expanded in polynomials. And in fact, it they converge uniformly, by the way. So it means that you can take the series in, under the integral. And, and the convenient basis is what's called the Bernstein polynomial because themselves, they are complete and they are and they are uh, positive in, in this interval. And moreover, if the function is positive, the coefficient are positive. These are convex combinations of positive polynomials. So all you have to do is basically integrate this function here, and then we provide the boundary or, your, or, or the space of positivity conditions. So this is represent all, bound, all bounds you can ever get uh, using just positivity of this measure. Now, x to the n integrated against the measure is a moment. If you multiply that by one minus x to the k, just take us uh, taking k times the discrete derivatives of that distribution. So the, the discrete analog of, um, of taking derivatives. And so basically the statement is just all bounds is like uh, saying that uh, the moment, these arcs, this physical thing that you can calculate in infrared are a complete monotonic series. Um, or in more mathematical terms, is just they fulfill what is called the Hausdorff moment problem. You're giving a series, it is a, is a series of moments, so it counts for integrating against a positive measure if and only if they satisfy this inequality, and the measure is unique. Okay, so there's no other constraints that you can enforce on, on the system. All right, so these are examples of the first few conditions of infinitely many. So you see the first one are just the, the, these arc are positive. Then you get some uh, monotonicity condition here that depends on the scale S, which is the radius of the arc. Now, to gain some intuition what this imply, let me first uh, see what these conditions are at three level. Three level, the amplitude is like a poly polynomial, it is analytic. And when you divide by the monomial, S to the two M plus three, you get only the, the, this arc, picks only the residue uh, coming from this guy. For n equals zero here, you would pick basically C2. It goes like one over S, this contribution, and so on and so forth. For, 
for n equal one, you will pick S4. So the arcs in the three-level approximation are just with the coefficient. And so they are bounded. So you just can just replace this a, a, n here with the width of coefficient. They have to satisfy all these, all these inequalities. Let me give you an immediate application of this fact. Take, for example, this one. This one, if you use the three-level approximation, is just telling you that, well, first of all, there is no IR branch cut here. So I can take the radius of the arc all the way close uh, to the cutoff. So S hat here is the cutoff. And you get immediately that, that the cutoff is bounded above. So you learn for where your theory has to break down. The latest at the ratio of two consecutive uh, uh, width of coefficients. Now, this has like uh, as an uh, interesting application. You, you, you can consider, for example, a theory of uh, massive higher spins, which um, makes sense uh, as a power counting goes. You can build an effective theory for them where they are at the bottom of the spectrum. There is a gap between their mass and the strong coupling scale. Okay? Um, maybe I should have mentioned here that this was done, for example, by except not only in this paper, but also by uh, Bonifacio and uh, Hinterdiegler. But what this bound is telling you is that that's the stock up scale is separated to the mass is actually irrelevant. What it matters is the ratio of two consecutive uh, uh, powers here, the energy that we fix the, the upper bound of the cutoff. And you see the theory of highest speed that's just the mass. So you learn that just the cutoff has to be the same size as the mass. So there's no actual thing as an effective theory for, for massive uh, high speed. So that's the end of, of, of this business. And that's explain why, for example, no matter what you do, varying the number of colors, varying the number of species, varying the number of flavors, you will never get uh, glue balls with high speed at the bottom of the spectrum separated from, from the other resins. This has nothing to do with gravity. Okay, this is just purely uh, reasoning in quantum physics. Okay, this brings me to another point that, so you have all bounds, but all bounds, as you see here, involves, so any level will involve bounds from different uh, uh, different arcs. For example, this one, AM, AM plus one, appears also in the next one. And, and AM plus two will appear also in the next one. So suppose I'm interested in only a finite number of them, and I have these infinitely many bounds, should be able to project taking convex combination in an optimal subspace of only a finite number of them. So how, how can you do that? Well, of course you can do it just by hand, just, just as I was doing with the neutron star, just you take linear combination, you do it. But you do have to do it infinitely many times. So there's a much more efficient way, which is now basically you're asking to integrate in the measure against some polynomial of fixed order. Okay, because I wanna only, the fixed amount of moments will appear eventually in this inequality. So the, the question becomes, what is the most general polynomial in the interval uh, that's positive? And those are also classified by mathematicians. There are just four of them. Of course, polynomial is positive if it's a square of a polynomial of half the order. Or if it's a square of a polynomial of n minus two divided by two times a polynomial x, which is not a square of a polynomial, but it's positive between zero and one. Or is a square times one minus x, which is also positive between zero and one, or the combination of those. So just this for possibility exhaust all of them. So let's see what this implies. For example, this one. This means that you take a polynomial Q equal alpha i x i square. So you get alpha i alpha j x i plus j. If the measure must be positive. But this means that this thing here, which is an ankle matrix, must be positive definite. So you get this condition. This one will give you a similar thing because just multiply by x, it shift all the moments inside the Hankel matrix by one. So the optimal bounds are just this. Okay, if you fix the order n that you want to get, you calculate a bunch of determinants and you get the optimal bounds. Let's see how you do that in a specific example. n equal two, you get this determinant. So a zero is positive, a one is positive. A0 is larger than A1 in units of the cutoff. A1 is larger than A2 in units of the cutoff, but also this determinant is positive. And this is precise, these constraints are precisely 
this this shape that I was I was uh, drawing uh, in the in the uh, in the neutral star example. You can do better than this, well, or better, sorry, you can keep going higher it, with, with the number of arcs, the more uh, measure, you know, if you access, if you have experimental access to more moments, more, more arcs, more width of coefficients. And now for n equal three, you have to calculate more, more determinants essentially. And, and they, in the space of these, uh, of these arcs, or in the travel approximation, you can think of these as width of coefficients, they basically, Really select this uh, uh, really thin this shape again is completely bounded. There is nothing you can just you cannot have one one width of which which is much larger than the others, and they cut a lot uh, the volume already the, of the of the cube. And uh, and uh, let me maybe now mention that this is strict this very uh, uh, tightly connected with the the fatty field theory hydron by Arcanian Wang and Wang, um, that in the four volume is basically this thing, they basically have these, these, these bounds here. In the limit when n goes to infinity, when they have all bounds. So, and, and the reason is that, that this one minus x polynomial that generates this one and this one, when you take an arbitrarily large polynomial, is also a square of polynomial. Is a, is a square of the square root of one minus x. But the square root of one minus x can be written as an infinitely long polynomial. So in the limit when n goes to infinity, indeed this nonlinear condition reproduces the world space of positivity. Except the advantage of using our approach is that for any truncated n, you are optimal, whereas in their case you, you are not. Um, Okay, so let me now move to applications uh, and, and reasoning about the uh, evolution, which actually was the thing that originated our work. We wanted to understand how the bounds evolve uh, with our G scale. And there are two pressing questions here. And um, the first is that, um, so the width of coefficients run, so on what are you actually putting a bound on? What scale and what coupling on what? And the second is um, the fact that you, the constraints themselves run because uh, you can take larger and larger arcs. Okay, they probe more and more uh, uh, region in the S plane within the fabric theory. So the second point is actually very easy to, to understand if you use these linear constraints. So you, rather than infinitely many no linear ones, you, you, you use the linear ones, and then it's very easy to understand how the constraint evolve, because if you take the real respect to the radius of the arc, they are, uh, they are negative definite. And, and well, it's very simple because you are swapping less and less measure. And uh, this means that converts, if you, if, you, if you flow towards the UV, so taking smaller arcs, the constraint become weaker and weaker. So eventually they are all satisfied. So this is represented in this picture. So suppose you have in the UV some theory that would seem what's inconsistent and lives in the wrong in the wrong region here, but you let the coefficient run sufficiently long. For example, if the mass of your theory is sufficiently small relative to the cutoff for the theory, they all will, uh, will be attracted to the origin inside inside the large region because, because of this reason. And, um, and uh, but this converse is also interesting that the fact that the bound become more stringent as you go towards the UV. And you can use this to determine what the cutoff is. Imagine you, you are given some width of coefficient of the given scale, some measurements. So you leave inside here some energy scale. You ask, where is the cutoff of this theory? Now that I know I have made these measurements. Well, you know that if you run up eventually, you're gonna hit the boundary due to the constraint, okay? It is when you hit it, that is where the cutoff has to come the latest. So it's gonna give you an estimate of the cutoff. And this is very important to include the quantum effects for this type of trajectories here, in the evolutions, because this boundary here is the one associated to the homogeneous conditions uh, that classically do not know anything about the cutoff. So for those, uh, uh, including a G effect, it, it is very important. It will see an effect uh, in a second. 
So let me give you an example of, of this, uh, on the fetal algebra evolution. Again, the nice theory of Goldstones. So we have uh, C2S squared is the first coefficient. It doesn't run because it's the lowest dimension. Nobody uh, normalizes it. S to the fourth gets normalized by loops of two insertion C2. It generates this one. And in fact, this is an example to all order in perturbation theory because more power of C2, we have diff C2 is dimensionful, so we normalize uh, C6. C6 here gets normalized by C2 and C4, but it's going to be two loop exact and so on and so forth. So what are the arcs, including loop effects? So the arcs are to level contribution plus loop corrections. Now, beta four is C2 square over 16 per square. And so this term is never important relative to this unless you leave perturbation theory. So since we want to compute something, A0 is basically C2 and it's going to be positive. So nothing has changed, uh, including loop effects or not, as long as you, are, you want to be, uh, you want to be, uh, you want to do something that you can trust. A1 is now C4S, so it's the running version of C4. Is C4 created by the log running? Plus, again, correction from it, coming from this guy, from beta 6, which is, however, C4 times C2 over 16 per square. So it's going to be, never be important relative to C4, again, unless you leave uh, perturbation theory. So it means that A1 is C4, except it's, it's running C4. It's what you would have expected. So for the first two arcs, for the first two width coefficients, nothing dramatic happened. Lou is positive, C4 of S is positive, and C2 is larger than C4, running. Now, the thing changes with the third moment, with the third arc. So now you get that the third arc is C6 uh, running, but there is also a contribution from the loop of C2 now, against this guy here. Now, if you take S sufficiently small, no matter how um, small C2 coupling was, or how, no matter how large C6 coupling was, this term is going to dominate over C6. So in fact, this is, a, this is going to be a dramatic change in infrared. That's what I was alluding that eventually, this is a sort of erasing memory effect as you, as you go towards the infrared. And the reason for that is simply, it's simple that, well, it's the well-known fact that very relevant operators that we are, that we are talking here, uh, um, are dominated. In fact, uh, their contribution gets erased. The original contribution, the, the matching scale, gets erased by IR loops. Okay, that's the, that's the reason. In fact, they are called irrelevant operators because whatever the value they have, it doesn't matter. You are dominated by the calculable contribution in the infrared. In this case, this one. So this means that if you do look at the optimal bounds with three arcs or more, the bounds do change. Particular, you see C4 has to be larger than C6. Plus, so before it's actually negative, so it's actually stronger than that. There's a, there's a correction that comes from a loop. And also the determinant instead gets, uh, gets a weakened, weakened condition. So this is represented in this plot where uh, on the axis now I'm plotting the running C4 over C2 and the running C6 over C2. And so if you were doing a three level, you would be inside this dashed line region, the, the, the shape I was showing before. Instead, you have to live now inside the uh, colored region. And the color here means uh, uh, what the cutoff is of any given point, okay? Uh, so I'm giving a point on scale S, how much RG time it will take to hit the boundary, okay? As, as I evolve it up, because strain become more and more stringent, eventually you get violated, so you hit the boundary you hit uh, uh, at least, so the cutoff has to come earlier than that. So points that live here, blue, the cutoff is right around the corner. Points that live here are red, they, uh, they have a, 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 large, a large cutoff. Let me magnify this a little bit, changing variables to highlight some aspects of the story. So C4 over C2 now is in this axis, and now I have C6 running times C2 over C4 running squared. So this means that the classical 
three level bound or put inside this dashed line here in this region. Now you see that you can live outside that. Okay, you can live in this region here. And in particular, you can live outside the level bound with a large cutoff, okay? It is in the red, red, red region. If you, if, you, if you zoom even further going to uh, logarithmic scales, so you see the cutoff can be like uh, order 100 or, I mean, in fact, it's, uh, it's unbounded. It can be arbitrarily large and in the three level, three level forbidden region. So the bottom line is that C C C6, so the very irrelevant operators and the, and the determinant that you can build out of that can be both negative despite they having a, a, a large cutoff. So this basically open up a like, new class of theories that you can start thinking whether they actually admit or not a UV completion, despite the fact that they violate badly the three level bounds. Okay, so this uh, brings me to, uh, to the next uh, point I wanted to discuss, um, which are basically the beyond formulas. So far, I've discussed only bounds at final t. Mantestan variable t in the forward limit. I want to now discuss the contribution from this type of uh, um, operator, which will vanish when t goes to zero. So there are three effects. The first is that they, in fact, contribute to also the forward limit uh, abounds through loops. So once you do loops, for example, this guy here, the Wilson uh, type of, sorry, the Galileon type operator squared or simple squared and normalized beta six, so the coefficient of C six. And see, by the positive bound of that, you're gonna get bound of this form, so type of upper bound on the Galilean uh, couplings. This is shown here, is this bound over here that improve um, this, this uh, old bound of us from uh, a few years back. Now, the other, so I'm plotting C4 over C2 and C2, one over C2. So I'm plotting ratio with the coefficients. I'm just saying that this guy, even though they don't, do not contribute in the full limit, they enter to loops that affect the positivity bounds also in the formal limit. So you get this type of bounds, but you can do much more than that. Okay, so you can just do now a partial wave decomposition and that will teach you that you don't only have a positive measure. You don't, not only the major part of M is positive. In fact, all the T derivatives are positive of the major part. So you have a, fa you have a, you have a infinite family of positive measure you can again uh, integrate against. So you get basically now arcs with two indices. And when you marginalize over all these conditions, all these moments uh, associated with these positive measures, now you get some lower bounds on, 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 the, on, this, on this type of uh, width coefficients. So they can be negative a little bit, but not too negative, okay? And these are represented in this bound here. And, and uh, I think the first bound of this type was found here, which is representing this dashed line. Go by, you can, these are optimal bounds involving three moments. So it actually gets improved uh, by, by this line. And of course, I believe these are also present in the paper by Akinamed, Wang and Wang, uh, although I, I haven't read it because uh, it was out uh, on, on January 1st and I was in vacation. So I, but I believe they have all bounds as well. So this, it must be true. Finally, uh, these things are related by crossing symmetry. So this type of operator is related by crossing symmetry. Let me give you a specific example. This is a single operator that involves s to the fourth. And that single operator generates s squared plus t squared plus u squared, everything squared. So it means that the coefficient c to two here is the same as the coefficient of c4 up to a factor of three by combinatorics. So because c4 is bounded, this means that c to two is also bounded. This put for the, for the constraints. So bottom line of this story is that if you write a table like this one, but you write all with coefficients of increasing power of S or increasing power of T, everything that's in red or in orange here is bounded above and below. And C2 is bounded uh, only below, so it's positive, and C0 is basically unbounded by, by these arguments. 
Okay, so let's see how am I doing with time. Um, almost done. Almost done. Okay, I'll be quick. Yeah. Um, you can do perhaps even better. So we so far we have been doing uh, uh, optimal. So all bounds that we present I presented are optimal under the assumption that we made. Okay, that positivity of the measures and all this, of course, and these things. But you can try to do uh, smarter things. And that's what these uh, authors uh, have tried to do, uh, improving even further the bound on C21, for example, C21, or even on other things. So what's, what, what was the idea? So the idea is that not only you are going to marginalize over all possible measures to get bounds on the moments, just assuming they are positive measures, but you, you require a further condition which is that basically the second derivative of the arc, for example, in this case that I'm going to present, the second derivative of the arc is equal to three times the first arc. This comes about because, as I was telling you, there's a single operator that generates both C22 and, and C4, and these are connected. So at three level, this relation is correct. So if you require a further constraint, of course, you can stop stronger bounds. So very, very clever idea. But I also mentioned that uh, very relevant operators get erased by the IR loops. So they, they are, you are dominated by the IR loops. And here we are talking about very irrelevant operators. So we have to be careful in, in trusting a three-level result as enforcing as an, actual, uh, as an actual condition on the measure that goes all the way up to infinite edge. More so, more so, if these conditions actually is by design cancel the three-level contribution, it means that whether it's a good one or not, you have to go look the first non-trivial contribution, which is one coming from, from loops. Okay, let's look at this loop correction. So they go like s squared t squared log t. Of course, this power of t has have to be there because t log Olson is well defined in the formal limit. So when t goes to zero, the amplitude goes to zero. I mean, it goes to a power of polynomial in S, sorry, but it's finite. And, um, and its first derivative is also finite. But the second derivative is not finite. So you see, you take two t derivatives, then it diverges with the log. Now, of course, this log is cut by the mass. But this means that this combination here is going to be cut by, by, by the mass. So if your theory as very light stays, or you take it to the margin masses limit, this bound unfortunately evaporate. And there is, there is a very simple reason for that. And um, you can understand that this, this, this bound, as I was stressed in this paper here, basically enforces some rule between the higher spin, the partial waves, they have to compensate uh, the lower spin, spin two contribution to the partial wave. Uh, because of these conditions. But if you have massless or near to massless states, the angular momentum, you can have large spin states just by scattering states which are very separated in, in the impact parameters. You can scatter the, the, like a planet against a star. They are very, very far apart. They have a, a, a huge uh, angular momentum. So that, that's the reason why this bound disappears. Okay, so I think I'm done. Uh, Let's go back to where we started. I think we answered basically the question, what is what's this geometrical object that all uh, uh, um, IR finite uh, amplitudes have to satisfy in, the, in, in effective theories is basically determining this stereo positive amplitude is nothing but an instance of stereo moments, okay? And what I present here is a complete set of positivity bounds. I believe it's equivalent to the fatty field theory in Hedron, although we show how to extract what's optimal bounds and its truncation. And I, I show you what's the importance of including a G evolution, especially if you want to determine what the cutoff is in your theory, or for example, even to rule, rule out theories. And I mentioned very briefly at the end uh, the importance of your divergences for uh, very relevant operators, and this basically for the, for the Galileans. Of course, this was an air divergence that come at loop level, 
And it might be the higher divergence that comes also at three level. For example, you have a three point vertex. That's what Claudia was discussing. Uh, in gravity, you have the T-channel pole. And uh, I'll be happy also to, to, to tell you a little bit more about that uh, um, if you're interested. OK, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Brando. Thank you for a very interesting uh, talk. Uh, so we have very few minutes for uh, <coughs> questions. Uh, in case uh, you have, uh, we went a little bit beyond because of the previous talk. Uh, so any any concrete question? I can see Elias again. Sorry for bothering Fernando. I have a question for Brando. Um, I like your background actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's to keep us, uh, you know, cheery. Um, uh, Basically, suppose you have a, a theory of a single scalar, and typically to derive your uh, your constraints, you assume some background, let's say typically a trivial background, and then scattering around that background, and you get inequalities. Now, if you change the background, let's say you expand around some other non-trivial solution, and you redo uh, the procedure, in principle, you expect to get probably some different constraints. The question is, have you thought to what extent this type of reasoning can be uh, uh, turned around? That is, to either or, uh, constrain the types of backgrounds you can choose, or to use non-trivial backgrounds in order to provide more constraints on coefficients. Yeah, so thank you. I mean, this is a beautiful question. I'm not sure I have a general answer. I, I, I know for experience by trying, that often you, you, for example, let me, let me maybe I give you a concrete example thing I, I worked on. So we have these bounds on the compatified positivity that Claudia mentioned uh, going using scattering amplitude in 3D. And we just reproduce all of them without using amplitudes, but just finding a right, a right background. Gravitational background solutions, we reproduce all of them. So, and including, and these backgrounds involve black holes or involve black brains. So we do find, in fact, that there is a map between amplitudes bound and backgrounds. But so far, I'm not able to tell you that it's a one-to-one -one map. Okay, that's uh, that's uh, I don't have a, a sharp argument for that. I can tell you by experience that there is a map. Okay, I see. Thank you, okay, Enrico. You have a question. Yeah, uh, thanks, Brenda. Very, very nice talk. It's a nice set of results. I have a quick question just kind of for my, to build connection in my brain between these results and the much more naive and, and unspecific concept of naturalness that gives us expectations for the values of these Wilsonian coefficients. To some extent, it seems that this sharpens that concept. It tells, yeah, not order one, but actually order one obeying this very specific uh, uh, infinite set of constraints. But is it even clear that this could, I mean, now you study a simple theory, but maybe you study a more complicated theory. Could this ever end up being in conflict with naturalness and give you bounds that exclude expectation given on naturalness? What is the interplay between this sharp bounds and what one would naively expect. Okay, so let me first say, uh, Rico, that um, I mean, this is not a simple, it's not a, a, a simple theory. I mean, in the forward limit, this, this, the world theory that have a single flavor are covered by, by this analysis. Now, so you have to go either beyond forward or have more flavors. Um, now, for naturalness, I admit that we are actually thinking how to use these positive bounds to, to, to prove the unnatural, um, unnatural mass hierarchies, for example, for, for the IF problem, do are actually can be uh, even favored by, by positivities, but uh, we haven't, uh, we don't have a concrete thing so far. I mean, it's like super preliminary and, uh, and, um, but we, we, we actually try to have, have some idea how to. So it's true that this inequality like is telling you, look, after all, the Wilson coefficient have to be decreasing, kind of expected. 
maybe it's not as bad that they have to you know to leave it precise. I mean, there are precise bounds, and you you, you are telling where they live and how they evolve, how they're going to hit the boundary, and you can start where the cutoff is. That's something that nature is not going to tell you. A, you, know, you can have such sharp statements here. But it's true that nevertheless they seem in agreement with uh, uh, with uh, with uh, natural expectations. Um, let me see if there's an instance where this is not the case. Well, so, so, so sorry, let me say back one thing. So in the case of uh, uh, the highest spin example, you, you can build an example, it is an example that where you have a power counting that's consistent with naturalness. You can organize your effective theory consistent with naturalness, but the positive bound is much stronger than that it actually rules it out. Okay, so you see, you learn much more than that. Yeah, right. Expanding a bit on this, uh, could you say something beyond what people have uh, usually say about the effective theory of the standard model? I mean, that, 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 that's so. So this is, goes back to the question about that I was telling you that we, we would like to use this to, to put bounds on hierarchy of masses, for example. Mm -hmm. why, why the Higgs mass is more relative to the cutoff, which we know is, is as large as the TV scale. But Planck scale. And uh, so the standard model is very high because it's a normalizable theory. So it's not even clear. So if you forget gravity, it's not even clear that it's going to be eigen dimensional operators. Uh, let me just start adding eigen dimensional operators and we know. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So let, let me. So if you focus on the Higgs boson, the Higgs boson is like a phi to the fourth type of theory. That's not UV complete. It's a lambda boson. So for sure, there's going to be eigen dimensional operators on that. It does have precisely thing we are thinking uh, uh, on, on trying to extend uh, the standard model. I think it's like it's a long shot. I think I think do claim something on normalizable theories. It's probably I would say I mean we know they are basically consistent. So now the inconsistency of phi to the fourth is exponentially separated I scale from the Landau pole. It's very difficult that you're going to catch that. But okay, we, we, we are going to try. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brando, for the very nice uh, talk. And then now we will have a break.